when you're younger, you, you kind of really, all you think about is, is life. You think about kind of the beginning and, and how life is lived. But then as you grow older, you begin to think more about death. And then as you get closer from the beginning to the ending, you start thinking about all that was in between. And you really start wondering, did my life really matter? Did my life really count? And then you even turn your focus to, but how am I going to end up? That's exactly what a king named David was thinking about and doing as he wrote the last stanza of a song in what we call the 23rd Psalm. It is the most famous of all the psalms. This psalm has topped the charts for more than 2,500 years. There are 150 psalms in the book of Psalms, and yet there is no question about it. This psalm, the 23rd Psalm, is the best known, the best loved, the most quoted psalm of all of them. If you're just joining us for the first time, we have been in a series that we've been calling Pitch Perfect. Because when you read this psalm, it is so incredible to see how rich, so deep, how powerful it is, and how it addresses life from the beginning, through the storyline, all the way to the end. Now, when David wrote this last stanza, verse 6 in Psalm 23, he didn't know how many days, how many weeks, how many months, how many years he had left in his life, but he definitely closes on a high note. He's describing what his life will be like until it ends, and then he's anticipating what his life will be like after it ends. In other words, what David does in the last stanza of this song is he's looking at the now, and he's looking at the forever. He's looking at the beginning, the storyline, and the end, and then what comes after that storyline. Now, if, if you're like 80% of the people in this country, you either believe there's more to life than this life, or you hope there's more to life than this life. You hope that life has a comma at the end of the sentence, not a period. Well, in the last stanza in this beautiful song, David shares with us that there is more to life than this life if one thing is true, if the Lord is our shepherd. If the Lord is our shepherd, there is more to life than this life. So let's listen to this last stanza now. David said, surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. That's the now. And after the ending, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. David is talking about now, and he's talking about forever. And David tells us two things about life. One about life after death, one about life before death. If the Lord is our shepherd, is absolutely true. So just two quick things today. He said, now we live in God's hands on earth. If the Lord is your shepherd, right now, wherever you are, or whatever your circumstances, you are in God's hands on earth. Now, David is convinced that no matter how many chapters of life are left in the book of his life, it doesn't matter. Here's what he believes. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. David's absolutely convinced no matter where I am, what I'm doing, no matter what situation I'm in, every morning when I get up, two things are going to come behind me all of my life. God's goodness and God's love. They're going to follow me every day in every, every way. I can't shake them. I can't hide from them. I can't lose them. I, I can't get away from them. He says every time he looks behind him, he knows two things are right there. God's goodness and God's love. Now, the first one is God's goodness. Listen to it again. He said, surely your goodness and your love will follow me. He says, God's goodness will follow behind me all the time. Now, let me say this. I am not saying, David was not saying, and this verse does not mean that everything that happens to us all the time is always going to be good. What it does mean is this. No matter what happens to us, when it happens, where it happens, how it happens, some way, somehow, this magnificent God, this shepherd of ours, is going to take everything that comes our way, and he's going to work it out for our good. Now, you may find this hard to believe, but God's goodness is always right behind you. It is always right around you. It is always right above you. As a matter of fact, Every good thing that ever happens to you, every good thing that ever comes to you comes from God. Don't take my word for it. James, the brother of Jesus, 
who, by the way, was eventually beheaded. James, the brother of Jesus, said this. He said, every good and perfect gift is from above. Think about every good thing that's ever come into your life, no matter what kind of good thing it may be, material, immaterial, spiritual, natural, doesn't matter. Think of every good thing, things you would consider good that's come into your life. He said, they have come down from the Father. Every good thing we have comes from God. Now, admittedly, there are some things that are good things that God gives us, but we don't realize it, and we don't recognize it. Let, let me just give you an example. Take lightning. Just, just think about that bolt of lightning that occasionally you see that flashes across the sky. Did you know that the goodness of God is even in a flash of lightning? For example, we've got to have nitrogen in our body or we can't live. That's one of the, that's one of the chemicals. That, that's one of the compounds that we've got to have in our body if we're even going to survive. The problem is... Although the atmosphere is full of it, we can't breathe it into our lungs. It's, it's impossible. We can't absorb it into our lungs because it would kill us. So here's what God does. God sends this electro, electrical charge called lightning flashing through the air. And here's what it does. He, it, it, it separates the nitrate in the atmosphere from the nitrite. It, it separates actually the nitrogen from the atmosphere and the rain, and it brings that nitrogen down to earth. Now, when that rain hits, there's this, there's this little bacteria that transforms that nitrate into a nitrite in the form where a plant can absorb it. And then here's what happens. When we eat the plant that absorbs that nitrite, or we eat the animal that ate the plant that absorbs that nitrite, we get the nitrogen into our body that we need to survive. So the next time you just simply see a bolt of lightning flash through the sky, you can say, God, you are so good. Your goodness follows me everywhere I go. See, the problem is we take God's goodness for granted so often that, that, that we just forget how good God is. Now, God's Goodness always follows us. It goes with us everywhere we go. But watch this. David said, not only does God's goodness follow us all the days of our life, God's love follows us all the days of our life. He says, surely your goodness and love will follow me. Now, that word for follow literally means to pursue or to run after. In other words, here's what David was saying. If the Lord is your shepherd, every day of your life, right on your heels, right behind you, never leaving you, you've got God's goodness and you've got God's love. They are right on your heels. They are always at your back. Let me tell you something. There's one thing you'll never hear God say. Never. You will never hear God say these words. I don't love you anymore. You may hear that from a girlfriend or a boyfriend. You may hear that from a former wife or a former husband. You may hear that from a, someone you thought was your best buddy. But you will never hear God say, I don't love you anymore. There is never, there's, no, there's one thing that nobody in this world is ever without, whether they realize it or not. Nobody is ever without the love of God. There's one thing you can never leave behind. There's one thing you can never shut the door on, and that is the love of God. And listen to me carefully. God's love runs hot all the time. It doesn't run hot one day cold the next. His love runs hot all the time. He will love you just the same when you do bad. He'll love you just the same when you do good. He won't love you more when you do what's good. And he won't love you less when you do what is bad. Do you know what the cross of Jesus is? The cross of Jesus Christ is God saying to you and to me and the entire world every day, no matter how you've wrecked your life, no matter how you have totaled your life, no matter how you have messed up and fouled up your life, it is you that I love. Now, here's the question. Why does David talk about these last two things, goodness and and love. Well, remember, this is a shepherd song. It's a shepherd about, you know, talking about sheep. Now, shepherds don't drive sheep. They lead sheep. Shepherds are always out front. Well, now, wait a minute. Who would bring up the rear? We've been talking about a shepherd, but the shepherd's always out front. He may have 100, 200, 300 sheep. He can't see all the way back. 
So who brings up the front? Well, every shepherd that has a large flock always have trained sheep dogs. And normally there would be two dogs. And, 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 and they knew exactly what their job was. Their job was to follow behind the sheep and, and if a sheep started, you know, wandering off or a sheep, you know, got hurt or started falling behind, they, they would bark and they would alert the shepherd to come and take care of that sheep. That was their job. And what David was saying was, this is so cool. David was saying, you know, I'm not only, I'm not only gonna lead you. God's not only gonna lead you as your shepherd. He'll be out front. But he's also got your back covered too. He's got this sheep dog called goodness. And he's got this sheep dog called love. And he said, they're always right behind you. They're always watching over you. They're always helping you when you have a need. And by the way, I am so glad that David tells us this goodness and this love doesn't just follow us some of the days of our life or most of the days of our life. He says, they are following me all the days of of my life. Think about that. God never flips the switch. He never turns his goodness off. He never turns his love off. He's not good one day and bad the next. He's not loving one day and unloving the next. David said, all the days of my life until I draw my very last breath, God's goodness and God's love follow me right on my heels, right behind me. See, if Jesus is your Lord, if he is your shepherd, in the now, right now, we live in God's hands on earth. But now, wait a minute. What about when the book is closed? What about when the last word is read? What about when life is over? What after the now? What about the forever? Now? I live in God's hands on earth. But if the Lord is our shepherd, we will live in God's house for eternity. In God's hands on earth, in God's house for eternity. Now, there's a seemingly insignificant word in this psalm you might miss normally. But it's, a, it's that little word, but it's a big word. It's called and. Now, I want you to listen to this verse with that word in mind. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That word connects our today with our yesterday. It connects our present with our future. It connects our life with our death. It, it connects our beginning and our ending. But what comes after the end? Here's what he says. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. David had one final goal in his life. There was one more thing he wanted to do. It was his major goal. It was his greatest goal. It was his one goal. He said, I want to live in God's house forever. I don't mind telling you, that's my last goal. That's my major goal. That's my one goal. I want to live in God's house forever. He doesn't just say like some people say, I'll just die. <clears throat> I'll just cease to exist. I'm just going to dissolve into nothingness. He says, no, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. By the way, that would really speak to a shepherd. You know why? Shepherds really didn't have a home. Shepherds were always on the move. Shepherds lived in tents. And as soon as sheep clean off one spot and eat all the grass in one spot, what do they have to do? They got to move to another spot. They've got to move on. So a shepherd never got to settle down in one place. A shepherd not, never got to call any one place his home. But David says, one day, I'm going to make my final move. And by the way, it's interesting. The Bible talks about your body being like a tent and, and death takes the tent down. That's exactly what happens. David says, one day my tent is going to come down and I'm not gonna have a tent anymore. I'm going to a home that will never move and I'll never have to move again. I'm going to my final destination. I'm going to live in the house of the Lord forever. But now watch this. What makes this house so special is not the size of it. It's not the shape of it. What makes this house so special is who lives in it and who it belongs to. It is the house 
of the Lord. By the way, if you notice something, do you notice that this psalm, this song begins with the Lord and it ends with the Lord? The Lord is my shepherd. It starts with the Lord. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. It ends with the Lord. Let me tell you why that's such a big deal. People ask a lot of times about heaven. What's heaven like and what's it going to be like? We, you know, I, I, I don't think even the English language can describe it. And I think, you know, God goes out of his way in, 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 with the limitations of human language to make it as beautiful as it can be. But I want you to get something in your mind today. What makes heaven heaven is not pearly gates. What makes heaven heaven is not golden streets. What makes heaven heaven is not a river of life. What makes heaven heaven is not there be light and no darkness. What makes heaven heaven is God. What makes heaven heaven is God. See, heaven's not just a place. It's a person. If the Lord is your shepherd, your final place is not a box in the ground. Your final place is not ashes in a jar. Your final place is God's house and God himself. Look, I don't know all the facts about the future. I'm just like you. I don't know how I'm going to die. I don't know when I'm going to die. I don't know where I'm going to die. I don't know the facts about the future, but I'll tell you what I do know. I know the finality of my future. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And see, what blesses me about this song we've been studying, and I hope you've been blessed like I've been, but you know what really blesses me about this song is God saved the best for last. So let's go back. From the beginning, God says when it comes to your need, you'll never lack anything. He says when you're hungry, I'll lead you to green pastures. When you're thirsty, I'll lead you to still waters. If you get off on the wrong path, I'll lead you to the paths of righteousness. When you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll be right there beside you, protecting you with my rod and with my staff. In this life, when you're surrounded by enemies and tough times, you're going to be eating grace and peace and love and joy right off my table. And then he tells us that our earthly life is going to be full of goodness and love no matter what happens to us, because God's going to work everything out for our good. And he says, no matter what we do, he will always love us. And you say, man, it just can't get, any, it can't get any better, but it does, because then he tells us, then he tells us, if the Lord is your shepherd, the best is yet to be. Listen, even the very best this life has to offer you you haven't seen anything yet because I don't want you to miss the very last word of this psalm. What is it? Forever. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So I want, to, I want you to draw up real close and listen. Everybody is going to live somewhere forever. I'm going to live somewhere forever. You're going to live somewhere forever. I'm going to be somewhere forever. You're going to be somewhere forever. Now, I don't know what you're going to put before your forever. I don't know what your address is going to be, but you are going to be somewhere forever. And here's what God says. God wants your final destination to be heaven. When, when you come out of the valley of the shadow of death, he wants you to walk right into his house. And this is what life is all about. Life is a journey that's just getting you ready for your final destination. So I want to close with this fantastic, exciting story. I want to recommend a book to you that uh, is it's one of those you can't put it down books, and, and I just finished it just a, a, not a short time ago. It's by James Donovan. And it's called Shoot for the Moon. It's all about Apollo 11, the voyage that took man to the moon and landed him there for the first time. Well, the chapter where they talk about when Neil Armstrong actually landed on the moon, I mean, it, it's a heart-pumping, heart-racing chapter, and it keeps you on the edge of your seats. So let me tell you the story. Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin, they're, they're in this module, and they're going to land on the moon. Now, they're flying by computer, but it was about to land on the side of a crater uh, that, that uh, was about the size of a football stadium. And he said the boulders surrounding this thing were literally as big as automobiles. And Armstrong realized not only would that landing be extremely dangerous, but he said they were moving too fast to land there. 
So he did something he'd prepared for. He got it off the computer. He took manual control. He began to fly the module himself. Well, alarms started going off telling them that they were going too fast or were getting too close to the ground, but they just had to ignore those alarms because this is what they came for. So all the time now, the ground's getting closer and closer and closer. And Armstrong's looking for a place to land, and, and, and he's speaking to the ground control calmly, but back at the, in America, they measured his heart rate at 150 beats a minute. In other words, his adrenaline is overflowing. He is full bore. His life is hanging in the balance. And then he sees this relatively smooth area between some large craters and a field full of rocks. It, it wasn't perfect, but it would just, you know, have to do. So he said, how's the fuel? Well, the engine didn't carry more than about 12 minutes worth of fuel. And Aldrin said, well, we've got about 8% left. Now, here's the thing. By this time, in every simulation they had done back on Earth getting ready for this landing, the lunar module had either already touched down or it had crashed or it had been aborted. So this new landing site wasn't even in complete view yet. The fuel's getting low. And now this red light comes on. Well, back in Houston, they're counting down the seconds before the Eagle ran out of fuel. It had about 60 seconds left. You could cut the tension with a knife. There were even some that was about, about to tell Armstrong to abort, but now they realized it had entered in what's called the dead man zone. If you know anything about flying helicopters, you know that. It's an old helicopter term, meaning when you get into a dead man zone, it is too late to abort. Your downward velocity is going to crash you into the ground. There's nothing else you can do. No need to ignite the ascent engine to try to get back to the mothership. In other words, it was literally a do or die moment. They were moving left when a blue light flashed on the control panel. And it said two words that were the most beautiful words they'd heard in a long time. Lunar contact. In other words, one of the probes had touched the surface. Armstrong shut down the engine. Neither one of them had even felt the touchdown, but they had stopped moving. And at 2.17 Houston time, these two astronauts shook hands, checked to make sure that everything was off and all was at well. And after a few seconds, but with excitement in his voice, Neil Armstrong said those famous words, tranquility base here, the eagle has landed. Without telling anyone, those two astronauts had decided before they even took off wherever they land, <clears throat> they were going to call it Tranquility Base. When I read that story, I thought to myself, one of these days, we're going to take off from this planet. We're going to leave it at warp speed. We're, 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 we aren't going to, to be traveling, you know, from earth to the moon. We're going to be traveling from earth to eternity. But on this trip, we don't have to worry about fuel, crashing, or even getting back home. Because if the Lord is your shepherd, you will be home. It will be a home <clears throat> custom built by Jesus who died on a cross and came back from the grave so we can live in his house forever and ever. And that's exactly what we will do if the Lord is our shepherd and our lives will be pitch perfect. Hello, my name is James Merritt, and I'm so honored to be speaking to you right now through Kingdom Set. If I could have just a minute or two of your time, I want to ask you a very important question. Does mankind need a Savior? It's a profound question. But the answer starts with an understanding of the character of God. I believe that God is all-merciful, but I also believe that God is just. God created a perfect world for Adam and Eve, which is a true act of mercy and kindness, and yet they rebelled against it and disobeyed His direct commands. Now, I believe God can absolutely say to us, you're forgiven, which will satisfy His mercy. However, we must now deal with the justice of God. God is just, and He will punish wrongdoing. There's a price to be paid, even though God's mercy is willing to set us free from our sin. But how can we pay this price? How can you and I ever truly satisfy the wrath of God with just words and deeds? 
This, I believe, is the unsolvable dilemma we find ourselves in here on earth. Yes, we can rely on God's mercy, and I believe He is merciful, but we can't satisfy God's wrath. That's why we need a Savior. We need God to be willing to become a human being just like us, while at the same time remaining fully God. You say, why? Because only God can save us. This God-man is the only person who could ever pay the full price of your sins and my sins. Throughout history, there's only one person who's ever lived that met that criteria, that was fully God and fully man at the same time, and that person is Jesus. The Scriptures say that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. Abraham was taught this by God and was willing to sacrifice his own son, but God stopped him at the last second. However, blood was still needed, and God in His grace and mercy provided a ram to Abraham. God, because of His great mercy and kindness, has provided to us the blood of Jesus to pay the price for our sin. Jesus willingly gave His blood to all mankind when He bled and died a horrible death on the cross. He died for you and for me. And He did so, not only out of His great mercy, but also to fully satisfy the punishment that we deserve. Well, you may be asking, well, <clears throat> how do we know that Jesus was fully God and fully man at the same time? Well, we all agree that Jesus was fully man. He lived just like we did. He died just like we did. He got tired like we did. He spoke to countless people. His life is documented in the Bible and in the Quran. But we also know that Jesus was fully God because He did two things that only God can do. His incredible miracles, and He died and rose again to live forever. There are stories of people who died and were raised from the dead, such as Lazarus, but they all later died and were buried again. Only Jesus was raised from the dead to never die again. Every other prophet who has ever lived has died. But Jesus predicted He would die and rise again, and as a true prophet, He did exactly what He predicted He would do. Furthermore, He was worshipped by His disciples and others. And you know what? He accepted their worship. We all agree only God should be worshipped. Mankind needs a Savior, and the good news is the Savior has come. His name is Jesus. He came for you. He desires to know you, to love you, and to save you once and for all. If you want to connect with someone who can help answer your questions and to give you more information about what you've just heard, look for the number on the screen related to your country and call that number right now. I promise you, this will be the best call you'll ever make. Thank you for listening, and may God bless you and keep you.